Hi, good afternoon. That's loud. We'd like to thank you for coming. This is to discuss building an operations team from the ground up at Comcast. We'd like to start with speaker introductions. Hello, my name is Sheila Sabi. I am an OpenStack engineer. I work on the operations team at Comcast. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Rich. I also work at the operations team at Comcast, and I've been there for a little over a year now. And my name is Megan Rossetti. I am on the OpenStack operations team at Walmart. So we have a very, very quick quiz for you, <laughs> especially after our introductions. Just want to know which one of us doesn't seem to quite belong in this <laughs> talk. Just wondering, feel free to yell it out. <laughs> So I did recently make a change. I wanted full transparency to bring it up. I did recently make a change. Um, we had put in for the talk, and um, I'm very proud of the work that we have done. And I think that this is really good information to have throughout the community. And thankfully, both companies agreed and decided to move forward. So we're going to just jump into, jump into it. We've obviously gone through the speaker. Um, introduction. So our agenda today is to talk about things that worked at Comcast. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on the positives, but also talk about some things that we found as roadblocks, things that didn't quite work. Okay. So just to give you an overall view, the operations team is comprised of both the junior and senior level engineers who have experience throughout all aspects of operations. Um, the structure of an organizational team certainly can change from company to company. And I think it's critical to be able to take a step back and reevaluate every so often. Um, is the structure meeting the needs of the company? Uh, is it able to pivot quickly? Um, you're looking at primarily interrupt-driven work. Can you focus when you need to? The overall goal of the team has been to build and develop a team that is cross-trained in all areas. Through that, with continuous training and continuous improvement. Okay, some of our team responsibilities. Um, we make sure that the cloud is in good health. Um, so we do um, maintenances, upgrades, deployments, uh, customer onboarding. Our customers are internal uh, customers. They're not external customers. They're internal engineering teams that are moving their applications to the cloud. Um, so we have um, onboarding for them when we bring them onto the cloud, and that comes with a lot of um, training, phone calls, uh, education. Um, there's ongoing customer support as well, uh, reporting, and uh, logging and monitoring. The, oops, sorry. Some of the some of the some of the workload that uh, comes our way is um, the routine requests, like day-to-day -day ticketing, um, customer. Uh, we have a Slack channel. You know, we help. We do support, day-to-day -day support, and then reporting. Um, then we also have break fix, uh, break fix, incident management, um, kind of like emergency things that come up. And after hours support, 24 by 7, we're on call. We have a rotating schedule. Um, and then we also have maintaining kind of the overall health of the environments, and that is with maintenances, upgrades, and deployments when we have to expand and grow. Um, and then there's tech debt, kind of stuff that we need to work on. We know that we have to work on, but it's kind of in the backlog, or then project work as well, and automated, automation. So in looking at an overall workload of an operations team, it's critically important to be able to prioritize that workload to make certain that the team is able to focus on the priorities at hand. Highest priority are going to be any type of your emergency requests. Um, not that anything ever goes wrong, but in case you have any type of outages or incidents. And then to be able to triage priorities. And this is usually quite an ongoing rotation. Um, again, things change daily, weekly, monthly, being able to prioritize different tasks, different projects, and of course, different targets as well. Sometimes those can change. Also, rotating responsibilities, um, trying very hard not to have a single point of failure in which it's always the same person on call, or it's the 
always the same person handling customer inquiries. So being able to rotate that on-call on schedule, rotate through some of the customer support and maintenances, not having the same person always handling maintenances, but being able to have cross-team handle those different tasks. We have always found that communications has been extremely critical and transparency across team, really trying to eliminate the one-on-one -on -one conversations. And by that, I mean using a chat channel instead of taking a question to one individual, posting it out across the team so that you don't, you try to eliminate those side conversations. If somebody on the team knows and is able to answer, they chime right in. If not, then you have several, you might go through other iterations. You might also find that there's information lagging and that might move in another direction. And you may also find that you have five or six people who know exactly what you're talking about and they can jump right in. And you want to encourage that transparency as much as possible. Um, focusing on the agile method. Especially with operations, you have to be able to pivot very, very quickly. Um, any type of emergency request or a large project or, although it never happens, deadlines that get changed or moved up or reprioritized. You need to be able to, to move through that. And then meetings. Meetings are always this somewhat of a necessary evil sometimes. So really sticking to it starts at X time, it ends at X time, what's the agenda? And quite frankly, evaluating. Is this meeting necessary? Does the whole team need to be involved? Do we have the people that we need there? Is it a meeting to discuss a meeting about a future meeting? Probably not necessary then. And really, really keeping that time to a minimum so that the team really can focus on the priorities at hand. Okay. So one of the biggest parts of building an ops team is obviously finding the people for that team uh, and I really love how we've been uh, handling that process at Comcast. Uh, we keep the team involved in the entire hiring process from beginning to end. Um, that way, there's never a time when management just shows up one day and says, this is Todd, please make Todd fit into our team. Uh, it's always a group process, uh, starting with resume screening. We take the resumes we've got and we all uh, talk through them together, look for key points that we want in team members. Um, and then if we take a handful of those resumes and schedule phone interviews with them, we might not have the entire team on a single phone interview. That might be a little overwhelming. Uh, <laughs> but we do have two or three team members on those phone interviews, but then we discuss them as a whole team uh, to see if they move to the next step, which would be the in-person interview. And that, and for those, we do try at least to have the entire team. Um, now, when we do phone interviews and in person, um, we try to do uh, like a conference bridge sort of thing, uh, because our team may or may not all be in the office at once. Uh, we have a lot of remote work time, which is really nice. Um, and so we keep the team involved even if some people are in the office that day and some people are working from home. And even for in-person interview, I think we've done like Skype, uh, we've had like a person sitting at the uh, table, just a face on a laptop, but they're still involved in the process, um, whether they're in office or working remotely. Um, and keeping the team involved is a really good way to find the right people from very different angles. Somebody might have all the right qualifications on paper, but then if they can't hold up uh, in a group working environment, they might not be the right fit for us. Oh, and yes, yeah, the entire team makes the decision on whether to uh, choose to hire a person or pass on them. Uh, and then once somebody is hired, we still keep the team involved in growing uh, the new team member uh, into a uh, fully functioning member of our team. Uh, we try to split up the training uh, of a new team member between uh, different people's uh, experience and expertise. Um, and we try to keep even the most recent hires, even if they were just hired one month or two months ago, they're still training the newest person just so that we have a constant influx 
of training as people are brought on. And that helps people get a very wide range of knowledge in our cloud, as well as getting them good experience, uh, sort of teaching that knowledge to other people. We also try to make sure the training schedule is published. So everybody knows um, who will be handling which part of the training. So if at any point something needs to be um, moved or rescheduled, it's much easier when that's across the team as well. And it's a, check and it's a checklist, so we get to actually you know, mark things off, and then we know where, um, how, how much uh, development that person has made. So ongoing um, operational training. Um, how do we keep all the operations engineers up to speed with what is going on? Um, we do brown bags. If we have somebody who is an expert in Puppet or Ansible or somebody just recently may, may have uh, deployed a Solometer and they've, they've had that as their personal project, as soon as it goes um, into production, or well, right before it goes into production, we have brown bag sessions. And we encourage everybody from the team to come to the brown bag. And if they can't make it, we'll publish um, the presentation or we'll have tons of documentation on it so that ke people can actually keep up to speed with what's going on. Um, and we also like to keep the, uh, the, you know, at least two members of the team trained on a certain topic um, in, in order to prevent um, a single point of failure. Um, PGC days, sorry, that's the acronym. Uh, per personal growth days uh, and personal development days, uh, we have time allocated, um, depending on workload and priority, to work on stuff that we want to work on. We have people on our team that are working on Python. We have people that are working on expanding their SA Linux skills. Um, and we also have like bi-weekly Python training for people that are interested and they want to join. Um, and another example is like I had a brown bag session on how to do a commit. So everybody from the ops team came in and we found bugs and then we went through the entire process from A to Z and everybody put in a patch. So that was pretty cool. All right. So we wanted to run through as an ops team, again, really focusing on the positive. What worked? What have we seen that has really given us the best value in the team? And the overhaul, overall priority has to build a really cohesive team. Um, part of doing that has been through constant communication and a lot of transparency, really pulling the team in to have that input and that communication across board. Um, so what I'd like to do, what we'd like to do is open it up to the audience for questions. What are you finding within your companies that you might be stumbling over? What questions do you have for us? And really have a good Q&A session. And we do have a mic here that we can pass around. None? <laughs> Go ahead. So that is made as a determination, um, and honestly, even by the team, um, because of as the team has grown and developed, where some areas might need further. Um, so it depends if it's broad-based and it seems to work for the entire team, then that's looked at. If it's something that's more specialized, um, and then you know people who might be working in that particular area um, might attend and then bring that information back. Sure. I'm sorry. How large? How how large is your environment? And then how many uh, engineers do you have in your support team? Um, we have 20 plus uh, data centers. It's it's pretty large, um, and we've got. We started off with a handful of engineers, and we've pretty much doubled in size since then. So it's, it's been, it's pretty, I don't even know. We have uh, three different teams, but we're all kind of meshed into one team. It's uh, operations, development, and engineering. And so um, there, there are definitely like fuzzy areas between all three teams, because some of us work on, uh, we cross train with each other. Um, so I'd say uh, it's grown tremendously. Do you think that we could uh, do this on a lot smaller scale? With Absolutely. The same concepts? Mm -hmm. I think so. 
Definitely. Finding talent is also hard with OpenStack. There's definitely a steep learning curve, and that kind of goes hand in hand with the training um, that we do. We've found what works for us is to find Linux system admins for the op side and people that are passionate about open source. That has come a really long way for us because they understand the basics and then you start getting into OpenStack from there and, and as time goes by, you start learning everything. So the team started small. Over the years, they've definitely grown and expanded and that's where some of these concepts came out of. The team started small, what worked? And those carried over moving forward. Um, really finding with a, especially with the interview process, when the full team is involved, then the team is really on board for that person coming in. And, and you already have this vested interest in their success. And that's something that isn't always found and, and can translate when you come on board to a team and people weren't quite expecting you to be there or they haven't met you before. And sometimes that can carry over to um, feeling uncomfortable. So really putting the full teams involved, the training schedule is out, everybody is on the same page, and moving forward from that. But definitely, large or small scale. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> uh, do you consume uh, other operations support from Comcast and other areas, whether it be 24-7 network operations support, monitoring? You know, how does it divide between kind of the more um, OpenStack specific skill sets within your operations team and maybe other operations teams within the organization? Uh, sure. Um, so we do have uh, exactly as you said 24-7 uh, network operations center. Um, but that's really the only other internal uh, resource that we consume uh, in that regard. Uh, everything uh, OpenStack specific we definitely um, do the operations for. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on what that dividing line is between those two organizations? Because as a smaller scale shop, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's important for us to clearly define what, you know, maybe talk about what sure. works and what doesn't between that, that line. Um, so I guess our network operations, they monitor um, our servers like they would any server. Um, and so it's largely whether it's up or down or if some critical service on that server uh, has stopped working they'll get the alerts from that and then they'll contact us. Um, it doesn't matter to them that it's OpenStack servers. They don't know what's running on the server. Uh, it's much more uh, physical device monitoring for them. Um, and so what we uh, pay much closer t attention to is the actual OpenStack services. Um, we monitor how they're running, whether or not uh, they're running, if they go up or down. Um, it's also setting your SLAs, your SLAs mm -hmm. for OpenStack for a cloud environment um, generally are different from straight bare metal. Um, one node going down is not necessarily a pageable event at 3 a.m. Um, but establishing those, your SLAs out to your customer base as well. And a lot of that ends up being the company and the team and kind of how you build that out. Uh, I want to know, uh, does the operation team need to contribute back to the open stake, like uh, report the bugs or make some blue point? Yeah, sure. Um, the operations team does contribute back to the community. Everybody uh, has a strong point. Um, I want to say we have people that speak different languages, so if they don't want to do a commit or they're not ready to do a commit, they actually translate horizon like they'll tr they'll translate the horizon dashboard into a different language and that's help right there and contributing back to the community we have um, three people from our team are on the operations uh, operations guide uh, training team or not training team sorry it's like a specialty team yes and it's branched under docs so three people on the team are there they're you know every single two weeks we go we, we're in the meetings we help out people file bugs um, we also have <clears throat> we have a, the, our development team also, so they, they also contribute code. We've had people work in different sections like Neutron and Horizon. 
Um, but generally, you don't see that with an ops team for people to actually be con contributing back to the community. But it means a lot to us. And so every single person does something when it comes to that. It keeps us uh, very invested uh, in OpenStack uh, when your operations team is also members of the community. Uh, Question for you. Um, level one and level two help desk, how far does your training extend into that to maybe ease your team uh, workload? So I think level one and level two can vary greatly across companies. So I'm going to go off of a little bit of an assumption. So certainly let me know if I'm incorrect. Usually level one is eyes on glass. And then, um, and here's where it gets a little murky. You can do like a level 1.5 and, and then level two is usually your ops, um, maybe entry level, you know, more um, junior for level two and then level three is typically your more senior. Um, as far as a current setup, um, the, what Rich was speaking about earlier, the NOC is more a level one and then the ops team is more of the level two and it's rotated through. So it's not the same person. I mean, when you when you bring your new team members on, are new, when you bring new team team members on your team, are you also part of your training working into your level one? Not currently. Yeah, we provide documentation to them. That's kind of maybe where I was going as okay. the documentation, so that you, as you find new ways to solve it further down from you, I guess is where I was going with it. Hi, uh, I'm hoping this is in scope for this uh, talk, but uh, can you give us an overview of some of the tools that you use, uh, the operations team uses to monitor the physical infrastructure, the OpenStack infrastructure, and maybe the workloads running on top? Uh, sure. Um, I don't know exactly how much I can say, so I'll wait until that guy starts uh, shooting daggers at me. Um, <laughs> uh, so we do have a Nagios-based uh, hardware monitoring, uh, and it also monitors uh, the OpenStack services running on the servers as well. Um, uh, in terms of uh, workloads... Um, the applications that run on top are monitored by those teams. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we want to make sure that the infrastructure is up and running, but that's, we don't go past that. Yes. Um, open sex system. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I think someone over here was right first. over here. And, and then we'll come back. Have you uh, have you had to solve how to deal with some of these team problems across uh, large geographies or uh, significant time zone splits? Not all of the team is in the same location, so we do deal with remote team members. Uh, something that we do, uh, we communicate really well with each other. We have a constant uh, group chat going on. Uh, we just transferred tools, but it's it's all the same like group. Uh, chat no matter what tool you're using and that makes it, it it makes us feel like one big team whether or not we're all sitting in the same physical location if everybody is constantly talking to each other on that um, pitching in ideas helping out um, a lot of times it's really easy to forget uh, that they're not all in the same physical space and as I said we do also have remote work so there might be times when none of us are sitting in the same space but we still get the same uh, workload done because um, we uh, communicate really well. And we have daily stand-up, so every morning at X time we meet um, online and we post what we're working on um, today and what we worked on yesterday and if there are any blockers or issues. And so we, we pretty much know what everybody's doing all the time. <laughs> so I, uh, I took the same group chat approach to solve with a worldwide team. Mm -hmm. And it was really excellent because folks coming on can go onto the chat and review what happened in, mm -hmm. in Europe and, and stuff that time. Highly endorse it. Uh, good stuff. Mm -hmm. 
So if you want to categorize your problems in buckets, which are the top three buckets that you have? <laughs> uh, Resources? <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about technical problems. <laughs> ah. um, So do you mean like uh, customer issues that come our way or troubleshooting? What, uh, can you, can you uh, kind of expand on that? Let's say troubleshooting and that relates to uh, some open stack components like DBoss or Neutron or uh, Keystone errors or RabbitMQ errors. Or I think we're going to have a difficult time <laughs> diving. Well, it comes down to exactly what information, how, how much we can get into some yeah, of the I mean, the we've ran into RabbitMQ issues in the past, um, sometimes some networking issues, but um, those seem to be big ones. But overall, we're pretty, uh, it's pretty solid. It is a full enterprise production environment. I'm not sure if, um, I think sometimes that's not always um, the entire environment is production. This is the guy in the back that was going to throw <laughs> daggers. <laughs> Where do you guys burn your time? Um, so uh, we do have uh, customer support uh, in the same way that we talk to each other doing uh, group chat communications. We also have a channel to talk to our customers in that way. Um, so we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one customer uh, support through that. Um, and then also bringing people onto the cloud uh, also consumes uh, a large chunk of our time. Because um, then we're adding users, adding groups, uh, finding what region works best for them, um, fitting everybody into our cloud. Um, can be a pretty daunting task when you have so many people uh, wanting to get their projects into your cloud. Especially people that don't understand cloud native. Exactly. We have a lot of people uh, coming into our cloud uh, who still run on the pets model, and we try to get them into the, the more cattle model. Uh, if something goes wrong with one instance, that shouldn't kill your entire application. Uh, so we try, to, we try to get all of our uh, new, new projects on the cloud to understand things like high availability, um, backups, of course, um, and just try to get them to change their mindset so that our time isn't all being spent uh, trying to deal with single instances that have gone down and trying to fix those very minute problems. And we spend a lot of time on deployments as well. So upcoming deployments that are coming um, in the near future, we know what's happening, and so we work on uh, getting OpenStack installed and, and from end to end, and then uh, getting customers onto those new environments. One question I have is uh, uh, we actually just launched a Operations as a service for OpenStack is a, a solution it's called Chai. But one of the things that I wanted to ask you guys is, how much time do you spend uh, on a daily basis, uh, or on average, on automation? Right. So not everything can be solved by hiring people. Um, we spend a decent time, a uh, decent amount of time on automation. I. Uh, I personally uh, try to do a lot of automation uh, for our team, uh, especially when it comes to whenever we need to do maintenances or small upgrades on our cloud. Uh, we try to run those with an automation tool. Um, yeah, uh, we try to do automation with our deployments as well. Uh, so that's another good chunk of our time. Um, Coda. Yeah. Coda too. So. A lot of that is also prioritized. Um, as to what is needed today and what's needed down the road um, to try and help eliminate the overwhelming factor of we have to do all of this today right now and you know strategically plan out some of those projects what has to be done today what can be done in the, within the next quarter those kind of kind of tasks as well if you can share, um, besides Slack or whatever chat application you use, um, what 
what other tools do you find are most useful to you or really help you do your jobs, whether it be ticketing systems or what you use for prioritization and managing that workflow and, and all of that other fun stuff? Mm -hmm. If you can't share, I totally understand. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we use Puppet, we use Ansible, um, and, and to uh, Rich's point, if we could spend all day on automation, we probably would. But because we have uh, customers and we have the ticketing and we have, um, you know, calls and needs uh, and trying to get people cloudy, we, we can't spend our entire day on that. Um, but so we use Slack for chat. We used to use IRC. Um, and then, yeah, Puppet, Ansible, I can't think. Uh, Etherpad. There's definitely yeah, more. We, we, use, we use Jira, Jira for, for ticketing. Tickets. Um, every time there's a task, we, we basically put in a project ticket and then we put subtasks under it. We track our work all the time. We put how much time we've spent on it. We're very, very transparent. Um, what's really nice is putting details into the tickets. There are many times I've run into issues where I'll get paged on call at 4 o'clock in the morning and there will be X and X and X and X alert and I have no idea what's going on, but I'll just do a simple search in JIRA and boom, I found all the steps. I did this, I did this, I did this, I restarted this service and then boom, done, it's fixed. So we try to be transparent in our, in our ticketing system and it is JIRA. And within looking at that also um, because it's a customer supporting team, um, breaking that out actually into what is customer facing and then what's internal to the team um, because you find very different metrics <laughs> either combined or separate um, so and and also it you have a customer supporting base it, that's going to take priority and you need to be able to have that um, you don't want 300 tickets in which you know 10 of them are customers you don't want so much that you can't can't sort through things. So we try to make it very, um, very straightforward as to what's where. And sorry, just to follow up, do you, sure. use, since I, you said Jira, do you use Confluence for like a knowledge, like a wiki, or do you have something else to store yes. that group? So we do, yes, we do have a wiki, and that's kind of the source of truth for a lot of our docs. We have an internal wiki for our team. It's, and that's also accessible to our customers, but it's mainly for, our, for us, how to do this, how to do that. These are the maintenances that are upcoming. Here's the, the uh, standard method of procedure for it. Um, and then we also have FAQs kind of for our customers that we link to. We also have a forum, um, which is Confluence-based. And I think that's a, that brings up a really good lesson learned um, from any team kind of starting and ramping up. You have a tendency to get very focused on um, moving to production or, or being ready. Document, 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 because you can turn around and use that documentation as educational information across teams, with your customers. But if you build out that documentation as you're building out your platform, it'll save you a lot of time, a lot of time. So I have a question. Um, how often do you guys do deployment and do you have continuous delivery? And it, it do take outages while you're doing deployment? Um, boy, uh, our deployments, uh, it seems like they're getting exponentially uh, quicker uh, that we put out uh, new, new regions uh, to our cloud. Um, but I want to say we might average one, maybe two a month. Uh, yeah, I would say maybe two every two months. Is that, <laughs> like, it, it seems like. Yeah, that's probably more true overall, yeah. yeah. Um, and in terms of outages while we're deploying, uh, whenever we deploy, it's a new, um, new region in our cloud, so we're not taking anything away, we're only adding. Um, so there's no outages uh, from that. How, how do you deal with software upgrades? Like, I guess what version of um, OpenStack are you on now, and how do you keep up with the new releases all the time? We're running on Havana and Ice House right now. Um, it, it's tough to keep up with the, um, with the releases. Uh, we're a little bit behind. So um, I think that's pretty normal, though. The team started the proof of concept with really the beginning of OpenStack. And uh, so with that, as you go through building out and upgrades and such, um, there's more that you end up kind of carrying across. Yeah, and we're still, we are actually testing our migration right now as we speak, probably back in the office, um, to see, you know, what the best way is to do it. 
But the good thing is, uh, for some of our bigger customers, they understand how the cloud works. And so it's really easy for us to tell them. Uh, this is more, sp more specifically when we've had to do a maintenance on our region that requires uh, some downtime, however small that is. Uh, we, uh, we communicate to those customers. And if they've engineered their applications uh, for the cloud, uh, many times it's very easy for them to just flick a switch and their traffic stops going to that region and goes to their application in another region. Oh, I think he has the mic. The uh, pets versus cattle thing is mm -hmm. something every OpenStack ops team deals with. And what methods have you guys used to get people to transition to the cattle mindset? Uh, and how successful have you been? Honesty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, it has been a lot of if the same customer comes to us over and over and says, my instance is down, my instance is down, my instance is down, uh, we pretty much sit them down and say, you have to stop that. Um, <laughs> that's just not going to work. It, it gives, it's more work for you. It's more work for us. It's not making anybody happy. Um, so the best thing you can do is engineer your application in a way that if one instance goes down, it's not the end of your application. Um, so communication and honesty. Um, we don't have anything that necessarily forces somebody to be cloud ready before they uh, get onto our cloud. Um, We've talked about it though. We've talked mm -hmm. about putting together some sort of like training or prereq prior to coming onto the cloud. What we do is we give them um, a welcome letter. And in the welcome letter, if you read it, you'll see what you're supposed to do. Um, we also put together training videos. We've put together um, PowerPoint presentations. We get on the phone prior. There's a little checkbox when you get onboarded onto the cloud. Do you need more information? And if they check that, we'll, we'll reach out you know, extra. But um, as Rich said, you know, you'll, you'll still find people that have not changed their mindset yet, and it, it will just take a little bit more work. Where is it? Uh, you said you're cross-training inside the team. Um, how is that? How do you actually do that? And um, how do you motivate people to do it? Honestly, the motivation isn't, that hasn't been an issue. Um, I think part of it is also focusing on areas of interest, um, not necessarily if allowing people, you have a core operations team, you have core responsibilities that everybody on the team is going to need to t partake in, but then being, being able to expand um, within the team to sit in on a, a different project, work through something with other team members, not just on the operations, but also on dev and, and engineering. And then also the personal development days, um, you know, giving people an outlet of being able to expand um, upon their interests. I would say I haven't found a lack of motivation. A lot of times people on the operations team, once they have that area of interest, they want to work with the person on the engineering team who's doing storage, networking, um, so that they can learn from them and get more knowledge out of that. They might not be uh, going quite uh, as deep technically into it as uh, somebody doing the development and coding for that project, um, but it's very common for us to work with members uh, of the other facets of our team uh, as, as we're interested. So that goes for both sides. The, the guys that train are they, they have a message to send out, and the, the others, they just want to learn. Mm -hmm. oh, that's good for you. And it's in everybody's self-interest not to have a single point of failure. So people have really rallied around that to you know, share that knowledge. Um, we are coming right up on time, so I actually think you might, you're going to be our last question. Um, you kind of are talking about it from a very much a traditional infrastructure and then the app people. It's, there's not a kind of a, a, a lap overlap between um, kind of DevOps and architects working with, or infrastructure architects working with app people to actually understand how to design kind of more cloud native apps. 
do you have those people in your team? Do you have architects? Do you, uh, I know you talk about doing education videos, but that's still app developers. We, we have two people on our team that are actually developers. I mean, they were developers their entire career, and now they moved over to the op side. So it's pretty cool because they have experience on both fences, and they, they even do a lot of um, training with the rest of the guys on the team. Um, but, but it's definitely a gray area. I mean, you have, we have people that buddy up with the engineering team. Um, sometimes, like, when there's an incident, you want to know what happened or how they fixed it. You just sit with them or get the notes from them at the end, um, and then next time you're doing it. So it's really, really fuzzy. So we are actually right at time. I would like to thank everybody for attending, and thank you for the questions. Really, really great questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.